Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that singing mice are using two different brain systems when they do something called a duet. There's a strange kind of mouse that lives in Central American cloud forests, and they're musical mice, and they sing songs to each other. And a new study reveals how their brains orchestrate those rapid-fire duets. And they show the brains of the mice actually split up the musical work. So one brain system controls the content of the song, but another part, called the orofacial motor cortex, or OMC, orchestrates the split-second timing needed for them to work with each other. These mice are known as Alston's singing mice, and they're super quirky. And they're kind of like the famous singers with extreme green room demands, and they're kind of divas, according to the researchers, who had to get extra big terrariums and exercise equipment and special diets, just like you'd expect from any uh, big music star. And the mice are really loud, really vocal in the lab, and they really just studied them with EEG to figure out what's going on inside those brains. When they cooled the OMC of these mice, I'm not sure how they did that, hopefully with an ice pack, it slowed the nerve cells activity and the songs got longer which suggests that the brain region normally controls that song timing. And when they used the drug to silence the OMC, they couldn't sing in call and response with each other. So there's some weird stuff going on around the way those mice and probably people work when we're singing in a, in a functional unit like that. And as you might have guessed, we're going to be talking something about music, something about uh, high-end music, but not with a musician per se, but with none other than legendary music producer Rick Rubin, who is in probably more ways than he knows responsible for some of the work that I've done. Uh, it was a, the first time I met Rick uh, several years ago, it must have been 2013. I mentioned I was working on the Bulletproof Diet and Rick, just at the first, uh, first time we sat down for lunch, he said, hold on, let me make a phone call. And he called someone and that is why you guys read about it on the New York Times list because I was going to self-publish because I didn't know what I was doing. And all it took was like one poke from Rick in the right direction to, to get me to go, maybe I should publish this as a quote, real book. Uh, so Rick, I don't know if I've ever formally thanked you for that, but you set the wheels in motion uh, in, a, in a really cool way. But when I look back, I realized that pretty much 80% of the music that I've listened to while I'm writing my books is music that you've directly touched. Wow. Uh, we're talking about you know, Rage Against the Machine, um, I mean, Johnny Cash, and you've worked with Metallica, uh, <laughs> Kanye, like pretty much all of the all the people that you know you've worked with. But for people listening, uh, if you aren't familiar with Rick's work, uh, it's just kind of ridiculous. Go to Spotify, look up Rick Rubin playlist, and you just realize the music that probably makes the, the biggest memories of your life was touched by, by Rick, who has this zen-like... Uh, manner, these you know, big blue eyes that just look at you and this big beard. And he's probably the opposite of what you might think a music producer is. So I'm super honored to be not just interviewing Rick, but to be doing it at Shangri-La Recording Studios, which is why I sound so amazingly good, because I'm probably on a $50 billion microphone <laughs> sitting in a, in a place full of history right next door to uh, Bob Dylan's tour bus. It's one of the most epic things I could possibly imagine to be doing right now. So Rick, with that introduction, thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio. Thanks for having me. This may be a tough question for you. What was your singular most favorite experience producing music? The one that just stands out as like most memorable. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> think it's possible to answer the question. I'll say that the, th the thing that's most exciting about the process is when something goes from not very good to very good in this moment where very little has changed. So it, it, it feels like magic is happening. And when that happens, that's a really exciting experience. And you can be working on something for a long time and it's kind of trudging along in this boring way, boring, uninteresting way. And then for some reason, it shifts into, into being remarkable. 
and sometimes you you can't even tell the difference of what's different between when it's remarkable and when it was uninteresting five minutes earlier, but it happens. Anytime those moments of transformation happen and we get very excited, and then there's this feeling of, um, well, let's say it's a band performing and they're performing together and that starts that feeling of, oh my God, it's really good. Then there, then it's like scary because oh, are they going to make it to the end of the song? Is it going to be able to maintain this? Okay, you know, it's like because we don't even know why it's happening. It's like there's, it's so, all of this work is so out of our control. Ah, so we're we're uh, really at the mercy of the forces of the universe to control the process, and we're just we just have to be patient and uh, be open and allow it to happen. In, invite it to happen and uh sometimes it doesn't sometimes it doesn't but when it does it's really exciting you started def jam when you were a young man in college and you had an ear and eye and intuition of feel some way of picking out oh i don't know the beastie boys and and run dmc and and these very early transformative artists so you didn't rely on on a body of experience. Uh, oh, I've done this for 20 years. I became, you know, a master at doing this by putting in the hard work. Were you just always naturally, did you have a spark? Did, did you did you always sense things this way or did you get stronger over time? Because it, it feels like you've touched so many things consistently for 40 years. Yeah, it just seems like a natural, I, I really love music and I really love good music. And I'm, I'm the best way to describe what I do is I'm really just a fan. I'm, I'm a super fan of music. Okay. And, um, and I'm true to that fandom. So when I hear something, if it makes me lean forward and gets me excited, I know that that's good. I, I've seen you do that, uh, I think, one, one time when we were chatting or something. I, I mentioned uh, some older song that just did something for me. And, and I, I watched you, like your eyes change. You, you sort of like zoomed in on it if there's if that's the right word for it to sort of see if it had the thing for you and, and it did and it was just a song mm. i liked right mm. but um it, it was almost like a i would describe it as as watching uh a predator look at something not in a not in a bad way yeah. but just like if you see a big cat suddenly gets interested like the ears come up and like all the senses come out and look and go is that something that i want to eat <laughs> and you're like okay no that's not something but it was it was very tangible. Like I, I could feel that this intensity that just came on and it was probably a three second thing. You were born with that. Yes. But okay. I, but I think it's, I think you were born with it too, because it, it's a, it's a sensitivity. Yeah. It's something that we, I know that we share from discussions we've had yeah. before. And those are the same things that make us uncomfortable when we walk into certain places, <laughs> right. make, make you start sneezing. Um, uh, difficulties with traveling, right? It, ju- all of the, it's just a over, over sensitization that I just apply to music, but, but it, it really, uh, it complicates my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, being a highly sensitive person is a complicating factor, but it comes with a gift because there's times, and I do not claim any musical skills despite my, uh, my April Fool's rap video, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's times when I, I look at something and I go, that's it. Like, that's why mitochondria do this. And I don't know how I know it, but I know it. And then I do the work and you write about it and you realize, okay, you can put these ingredients together and have this effect uh, in a way that wasn't done before. It's, in, I, it's interesting, too, yeah. how often the science follows. Like, in music, we don't set the intention of what we want to make we just know we want it to be good, and we're open to the process. But okay. we don't decide it. We don't decide in advance. Oh, we're going to make a song that's a political song in it. We want it to do these things. It's not like that. Or I want to write a love song that's going to mean this to this person. It's not like that. It's all more of just an open, almost uh, like automatic writing process, where we're trying to tap into our subconscious and. F- let the ideas come through where we might not even know what it means. And then after it appears and after we realize we like it, then we might analyze it and try to understand 
what is it that we like? How does this work? But but we don't start with the the science and then build it. It's more like we're we're we have this magical moment that's more rooted in emotion. And then after that happens, we we then try to see if we can figure out why it is. Okay. Absolutely. And we don't always we can't always tell. <laughs> you know, we just know we like it. We don't yeah. always know why. Sometimes Sometimes it's like, oh, it does this, it does this, it does this. We like those things. That makes sense. And sometimes no idea. It seems like in music and art, it's okay to not know why something works. But when we get into the world of biohacking or medicine, if there's no reason for it to work, therefore it doesn't work. Well, hold on. It did work, but we, we couldn't explain it. How do you think music and art escaped that? Uh, that, that breaking down into its constituent elements thing so that, that you can say, that's a great song, couldn't tell you why, and people all know it's great. Do you have a theory? No, but I would say th- that theory, I would apply that theory to everything. And in, in my life, I don't need to know, I don't need to understand the science of why, some, why a biohack works or doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> and if there's something going on with me and there are 10 different possible ways of dealing with it, I'll try all 10. And I won't know which of them worked and which of them didn't, but I don't care. I just want it to work. You got the results, right? Yeah, that's all that all that I'm interested in yeah. is what works for me. It, it's a liberating perspective, uh, and I didn't used to have it because I was trained as an engineer. And like, I'm going to try this one thing and then this other thing. And you realize, same thing if you're trying to compose a song one instrument at a time without the other ones playing, it probably would not sound very good. Mm-hmm. So th- the same thing, if you're the goal is to do something. You might as well just do it all the way. And you and I have talked about a lot of different biohacks. And I know uh, I want to talk with you about some of the things that that you've done in biohacking that probably most people don't know about mm. uh, that are uh, that are particularly top of mind for you as a person who's in tune with the world around you. Uh, see what I did there? In tune. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the things that you find either are are particularly grounding and and really helpful for you, or the things that help you have more of that intuitive spark that you use. You know, the one I described, you sort of perk up and look around and just suck in whatever information is there to see if it hits your filters right. What are the things that are maybe like most grounding and settling and like reduce the over sense or the overstimulation that happens? Well, we'll start with a more n- nature based thing. So. Yeah. Being in nature, being close to the ocean, being barefoot as often as possible, being in water really helps me. I find that if I'm looking for the answer to a problem, instead of sitting and thinking about it, I may go for a swim. Mm. And um, something happens when we distract ourselves with a task that allows, I, I think, again, I'm, I'm, I don't know how it really works, but the way I would describe it is it seems like we can access a part of our brain that otherwise is engaged or otherwise hard to access mm. um, through some simple task. Can't be so difficult that it takes all of our attention. Right. But it could be as simple as driving. Sometimes when you're driving, yeah. like I know for many musicians, if they're working on melodies, they have more success if they listen to the music and drive and sing as they're driving. And just keeping themselves from driving off the road is enough of a task to keep them, fo- to have a focus and split their attention between the driving and this creative process. Sort of get the monkey mind a task. I, I first came across something like that in my undergrad I was the first person in my school to have a laptop because I am a geek and it had this game called free cell on it, you know, an early solitaire sort of thing. And I found out that if I played free cell during class, which pissed off the entire class, but then I would switch over and take notes that I could listen to what the teacher was saying so effectively. My notes were like the canonical notes for everyone in the class. And I was acing all my classes because I finally had that equivalent of driving, keeping that part of my brain busy so I could visualize what the teacher was saying and it made no sense at the time and it broke all the rules of multitasking uh, but for me it was strangely effective uh, even though i finally had to explain to everyone that they thought it was rude that i was playing the game and i thought it was rude that they were looking at my private screen so we'd have to agree that we were each rude but it, it feels like that same sort of an idea absolutely so, so maybe distracting yourself with a menial task 
Mm-hmm. Is I've one noticed. Of the I've noticed that um, many artists I work with tend to draw or scribble, uh, and while they're scribbling, they'll ideas will come, and words will come, or um, melodies will come, ideas will come. But and they and if you watch them, it just looks like they're they. It's a very childlike act, mm. and they look like little kids playing. And while that happens, this other thing arrives that's really beautiful. Wow! So it's the distraction. So for you, you're barefoot. Uh, you're you're electrically grounded. Uh, you're swimming. Uh, I'm guessing swimming, given that we're in Malibu, you're swimming in the ocean as much as you can versus chlorinated. Either pool. ocean or a pool, but either the one pool works. would be either a saltwater pool or a, a non-chlorinated pool. Okay, cool. You just don't want that on your skin and all. Okay, yeah. got it. I don't like the smell. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, in, in fact, a lot of the commercial pools that are indoors are super moldy too, because it's always humid and. Yeah, between the smell and the echoey stuff, I I don't find that pleasant. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what are the things? I I know that you're yeah. a meditator. What's the role of meditation in your craft of this ability to to not just be sensitive, but to have a focus sensitivity? Yeah, I think that that's what meditation is. Is uh, it develops your ability to to focus in a deep way, in a deep and patient way. Um, and I think patience is a big, a big part of it. But I, the first style of meditation I learned was transcendental meditation, and I've done that since I was fourteen years old. And since then, I've done, I've learned vipassana, and I've learned, uh, I use different guided meditations and apps, and um, metta, which is a, a Buddhist meditation. But I find myself coming back to TM, and it may just be because it was the first one I learned. I don't know. But it, but I really enjoy learning a new one and practicing it for a while and seeing what it does. Yeah, being a a dabbler in different types of meditation, I found to be valuable as well because mm. you never know what it's going to do. And I mean, I've I have a couple of them I do, and and you know, my arms will start shaking and there's electricity moving up my spine. I'm like, that's not my normal meditation. That's more Kundalini, but it's not a Kundalini meditation. It's an audio thing, and I don't know that I'd want to do that you know, before <laughs> bulletproof radio. Like that might be too much, but having kind of a Swiss army knife set of meditation tools is cool, but I find I still don't know exactly which one to do when. Mm. Do you sort of have a ritual that says, I'm going to do TM in the morning or before I, you know, go into extra creative mode, I would do a different style. Do you have a kind of a a thought process around that? I have a a loose one. So TM is typically first thing in the morning. If I'm, there are certain times where I've been, I've had uh, dealt with some depression in my life. And when I've been in depressed episodes, it's hard for me to stay with uh, a meditation that's a self-imposed meditation. And in those times, I find that a guided meditation helps more. I can focus on a voice directing me easier than I can direct myself mm. when that happens. So I use those in those occasions. Also, I, I do metta when I'm exercising, either when I'm, if I'm walking on the beach or if I'm swimming, I repeat the four meta phrases. What, what are they? And I, I repeat them twice just because it's, it makes it easier for me to remember them for some reason. Mm-hmm. May I be filled with loving kindness, filled with loving kindness, may I be well, may I be well, may I be peaceful and at ease, may I be peaceful and at ease, may I be happy, may I be happy. So. I'll do that while I'm walking, while I'm swimming in rhythm. And after a year of doing that practice, then you change it from may I to may we. Mm -hmm. And may we, the we, it would be your immediate family for the next year. And so for the first year, you have to build it in yourself before you can share it. Year two, you would do it for your immediate family. And as you progress over time, the we gets bigger and bigger until eventually you're doing it for all living beings or for the universe as you choose. But you have to build that charge. And it's really nice because again, as I said in this one, it's while I'm already walking, it's while I'm already swimming, and it um, it, it turns any activity into a meditation. Wow, that is, uh, that is really powerful. It reminds me of some of the shamanic fire ceremonies uh, that I've learned uh, from Alberto Viotto. For the first year, you have to do it by yourself and only under a full moon. Mm. <laughs> and then you can do it for someone else or with a trainer. And eventually you can do it for your community and, and things like that. And it, it feels, though, like a lot of that multi-year 
progression is missing from modern conversations about meditation at large. Do you think that do you think that this sort of quick fire meditation that a lot of us are doing for lack of a better word, I have 15 minutes, I'm going to use an app. Do you think it's enough or do you think that really we need to do some more? I of think these any things? opportunity to meditate is good. There's no, there's no bad version and there yeah. are no, you know, it's never too short and it's never too easy. It's fine. If you, if you do, uh, if you decide to do a three breath meditation, yes. it's great. The, the only meditation that hasn't worked for me was meditating on the blood of my enemies. That one did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one. I'm kidding. I just made it up. But I was like, yeah, there really isn't a bad one. And I was like, I could probably break that because I'm a hacker. Right? Uh, and it's uh, it's one of those things where I, stoplights for me are like, okay, I'll do a box breath or two. And, yeah. and that's really straightforward. Beautiful. Okay. I also I also really love um, ice baths. And, and the ice bath is very much a form of a forced meditation yes there's there's i don't know anyone who gets in the ice and is thinking about anything else it's a it's a single pointed yeah you're you're it's uh it feels like it's life and death uh which may be part of its power i don't know yeah it is very focusing that is, that's a fair point i can't imagine being on the phone in an ice bath no. <laughs> it's just, it wouldn't work no how often do you do ice baths now Typically, we'll do, I would say it works out to about five days a week, sauna okay. and ice. And you're still doing the Wim Hof breathing with it? Sometimes. Sometimes. Depends. Okay. depends. I love Wim Hof breathing. Yeah. It just cool. depends on where I am in my, it's like uh, the routines change all the time. Yeah. Uh, but that's one that I love and, and any opportunity to do it, it's, it's, it helps. It helps. Beautiful. Yeah. Five days a week. Oh, that is, that is intense. You've also, uh, You've lost 130 pounds. I, I only lost 100. And I know you've talked about this before, but I think a lot of people listening probably haven't heard that. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to cause you to lose 130 pounds? Well, it, it started, I, I've, I've tried to dil eat diligently my whole life. So it wasn't out of not doing the work. It was really out of more bad information. Yeah. And, uh, and I was a vegan for 23 years thinking that that was the healthiest diet I could have, I could have. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was killing me. Wow. Yeah. It was really bad. And I remember I went to a Tibetan doctor who was one of the Dalai Lama's doctors <laughs> and he did a, he does these, uh, the pulse wave analysis. Yeah, yeah. Six, six pulse analysis. And he did the six pulse analysis on me and he said, I want you to leave here and go get some bone broth. This is before I'd ever wow. heard of bone broth and drink that and you're going to feel better. And I said, I can't do that. I'm a vegan. And he said, you're dying. You need wow. bone broth. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't do it because I was a vegan. I was a brainwashed vegan. Those are some big words, Rick. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's the truth. Yeah. It's the I, truth. I was a devout raw vegan for not as, anywhere yeah. near 23 years, but it yeah. did make me sick as well. And I'm like, the enzymes are going to save me. I'm just going to eat more raw food. And yeah, yeah I, I hit a wall, maybe faster than you did. Maybe I started out with less vitality or something, but... I appreciate you being willing to just say that because it's true. if a vegan diet really works for someone, just get your lab test and see if it's really working because it's pretty hard to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, and again, I was, uh, I feel bad because as a vegan, I was preaching veganism. You know, yeah. it's, it kind of comes with the territory. Um, and then when I started eating meat again, it was really difficult. After, after not eating uh, meat for a long time, it's like, it'd be like eating human flesh. Uh -huh. So that was a real hump to get over. And uh, it started with, um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a long story. How much of the story do you want to go into? I think it'd be long? really valuable for people to hear this. Okay, we'll talk in order then. So I tried many things. Veganism clearly didn't work. I met a person named Phil Maffetone, who was a, a human performance expert. Yeah, who, I've met Phil. Yeah. yeah and he worked with uh, Olympic athletes. And uh, I read a book by a guy who ran 1,000 miles in 11 days. And I was thinking, well, I have trouble walking to the end of the block. How can someone do this? Like, how is this humanly possible? And yeah. I read his book. It was really inspiring. And he talks about how his life was changed when he met this Dr. Phil Maffetone. Uh, and then it's like I went online. And uh, this was maybe in web TV days before I even had a computer. <laughs> and uh, wrote a note to Phil. He said, uh, asked him if he would become my doctor. And he said that he had quit his medical practice because uh, he was retiring, and um, and he didn't know who I was. And 
we, we didn't really know each other at all. And it turned out he was retiring to become a songwriter. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, just so happens that um, maybe I can help you on the song side and you can help me on the health side and you can still do it even though you're retiring. And then we met several times for maybe a year and then eventually he came and he moved into my house wow. and he lived with me for two years and I did everything he said and I got very, very healthy but I still didn't lose weight. I, I lost maybe five pounds. So frustrating to go through that. <laughs> yeah, and I did everything. And he said, he said, 99 out of 100 people who have done what you do, and he said, I live with you. I see what you eat. I see the exercise that you do every day. 99 people would lose, would have lost all the weight immediately. Uh-huh. For some reason, it's not coming off. And of you weren't sneaking the Snickers bars. And this is what most not doctors tell all. people who don't lose weight. No, it, it's so just irritating and frustrating to be there. So, okay, so but you had a witness that you were doing everything right. No, but, and, but at least I felt better. Yeah. I had more vitality. Okay. He changed my circadian rhythm because I used to be up all night and sleep yeah. all day. He got me to wake up early in the morning. Uh, he got me to sleep longer and better at night. He had me start by adding fish and eggs to my diet, which oh. were two things that I never really liked, but he had me add those more as medicine, and he was just trying to get me to have some animal protein in my body. So now I'm healthier version of my 318 pound self, and um, I went out to lunch with one of my mentors, his name is Mo Austin, who's a, um, he worked for Frank Sinatra, and he ran Warner Brothers Records for 30 plus years signed Jimi Hendrix a real a real uh, beautiful person and um, f friend of the artists and I had lunch with him one day and he said you know Rick I'm really getting worried about you you're getting really big I'm gonna find a nutritionist I want you to go to my guy and I want you to do whatever he said whatever he says and I said I'll, I'll do that knowing it wasn't gonna work because I've done everything <laughs> and nothing works yes. uh, but I'm open to you know I'll follow at his request, but it, but it was there was no belief involved for sure. Yeah, uh, and I went to see this doctor at UCLA, and he put me on a diet of seven protein shakes a day, and like every two hours, uh -huh. and I could have fish soup and salad for dinner. So, it what it was was of high protein, low co low carb, and low calorie diet mm. it was definitely a, a calorie restricted diet right which i'd never done before mm -hmm. i'd done healthy diets but never calorie restricted um and i i did what he said in the first three days felt strange and then after that it felt perfectly normal mm. i went to see him two weeks later and i lost like 13 pounds wow so a, a lot and that gave me inspiration to continue and uh, it took something like 14 months to lose 130 pounds. And it was a great experience. And then from there, I s morphed into eating more real food. Uh -huh. In the experimenting I've done with keto, I see, again, I, I believe that the keto diet is healthy for most people. For some reason, for me, I do better with more protein than fat. You're pretty unusual that way. Um, and I, I know we've we've talked about it, and I'm I'm concerned that I'm seeing some of the aspects of veganism and keto today, mm. where it's like if you eat a carb again, you're a bad person. Like, but don't your gut bacteria sort of need some of those carbs to function? Uh, and so the the idea of going in and out of it and making sure you're actually eating more vegetables than steaks is pretty important. And it feels like uh, sort of as it becomes popular that there's a both a militancy and uh, you know, lack of paying attention to those little details that are going to make it work long term. Because uh, I know I certainly eat carbs. I just don't eat huge amounts of them, and I don't eat them every day. Uh, so you're not in ketosis now. You're pretty much on a high protein, moderate no, vegetable diet. No, kind of I would still say I'm. I'm like on the edge. Paleo slash keto. Okay. And I and for the last uh, maybe last six months or so, I've been. Um, doing uh intermittent fasting which i'm i'm really liking yeah it was hard to start it uh -huh. but once i'm in it i really enjoy it it's made a big difference for me too 
How about the longer fasts, like 48 hours? Never done it. I I did it a long time ago, back when I was heavy with maybe, uh, there was one called Arise and Shine. There was Mm. several of these cleanse type fasts. But but I think back then my blood sugar was so unstable that it that it it really didn't. I felt sick all the time. It's it's torture when you don't have control of your blood sugar. Uh-huh. It, yeah, that might be something to to play around with. Um, I've noticed if I go past forty eight hours on a fast, and usually if Lana takes the kids skiing or something for the weekend, I don't really want to do dishes. I love to cook, but I'd really just I want to focus. So I choose to do it then, and it's not during the fast really, but it's the day after. And then the day after that, where you just you feel all the inflammation in your body just kind of slurp away. It, it's a it's a pretty cool thing, uh, but the first time you do it, you you want to just see what your brain's going to do. But I found for me, you I think about food, but I don't crave food because I have control of my blood sugar now. And I would like to see that become a little bit more of a, a cultural norm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm putting some stuff together um, at Bulletproof where. Like I'll say, all right, once a month, like, hey guys, anyone who wants to join me on this, like this Monday and Tuesday, like I'm not gonna do it when we get on, you know, get on our group chat thing and and talk about it because uh, it, it's hard to put words to it, but there's a clarity that comes to me from that that goes beyond what intermittent fasting does. But even that, you, for six months, did it change your weight or did it change your mind? Like, what did you feel from the intermittent fasting? Definitely got a little leaner. Okay, like the way I just like the way it feels, and I and I definitely eat less overall. Yeah. Um, based on the restricted window, but both the timing of it and the desire, like I'm satiated sooner. Are you avoiding the uh, the eat after dark sort of things? You're eating window only during the day. No. Okay. I I start. I usually do. Typically, it's noon to eight p.m. Noon to eight. Yeah, that's a very typical one for yeah. uh, for me as well. And I've found that if I, I front load it, and where I live, it gets dark at like five because <laughs> I'm up in Canada, so it doesn't always work. But at least during summer, I I work on making sure that I'm not eating after dark because there's a circadian timing thing to that. Uh, but you don't have to be perfect, right? And no, and I, and I like if I can have dinner when it's light out, it's a good day. I okay. I prefer that. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Preferring it is a great way to put it, where you don't have to have it. Uh, you also do some more advanced biohacking stuff. Uh, what are some of the kind of cool, funky things that, that maybe you think people haven't heard of that you've found value in? Well, I uh, before sleep, I use a, uh, I think it's called, I think it's called cicada. It's a, a device with two electrodes that go on the forehead. Oh, interesting. Um, that that like calm the brain brain waves. Oh, it's a cerebral electrical stimulation yes. device. Okay, like a Russian sleep machine. It's called a Fisher Wallace device. Oh, a Fisher Wallace. Yeah, I recommended it on the blog years ago. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, it's I a use, prescription device that runs the electrical current, like the David one. Okay. So I use that. I use a um, intranasal red light. Ah, uh, uh, the Vilight. Yeah, yeah Vilight every night. I typically use a traditional sauna, but lately because we've been moving around a lot. I got a um, a sauna space tent with the red lights. So the beauty of that is I get the the sweat of the sauna plus the red light. Right. Uh, so it's the biophotomodulation mm-hmm. along with the sauna at once, which is nice. I used to use the Juve, which I still like. Um, but there's something about the s- sweating at the same time is... Yeah, just time wise, it, it it's very efficient. It, you and I could both spend ten hours a day biohacking and yes. not get anything done, and that's yes. that's the risk. So, like, I love the way you're stacking it, just like you stack meditation with swimming or walking, right? You, you might as well get the benefits. Yes. Okay. What about carbogen? Yeah, carbogen was a good one. That was something that Dr. Phil Maffetone recommended. It was something that they worked with brain injured kids, and it's a specific. Uh, amount a, a specific mix of oxygen and co2 without nitrogen yes oxygen co2 but i can't remember what the balance is okay i don't know you and, told uh, me once but I yeah <laughs> and you uh just inhale it with a mask for maybe 10 or 15 minutes while doing deep belly breathing and um it allows the oxygen to cross the blood brain barrier in a way that oxygen pure oxygen can't uh, so like it it tricks the system into allow, allowing more oxygen in. And um, I did that for quite some time. Hyperbaric oxygen, I've done quite a bit. More, more hyperbaric air more than hyperbaric oxygen. Yeah, just the pressure without the, breathing the oxygen. Yes. Yeah. All the stuff with Laird, like the pool workouts oh, and yeah. the uh, you know, heavy weights underwater. 
Those are the ones that come to mind. There's, I mean, it's endless, though. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> we it's, go down. It's playing at a certain point, yeah. but it's playing that sometimes has a really unusual yeah. benefit. Oh, I wear I wear blue blockers every night, really religiously. Me too. <laughs> I have only red lights in my house. Yeah. Yeah, those are the ones that come to mind, but but I'm sure as we talk more, we'll... Yeah. It, that's a pretty comprehensive list. I, I have never talked about carbogen. I think most people in biohacking have never heard of that. So there you go, guys. Go do some Googling and figure this out. There'll probably be carbogen clinics in, in another six weeks after this episode. But uh, I did try it that one time, yeah. and uh, it, it, it did something good oxygen-wise. It felt a little bit like the thing that we do, uh, we call it uh, intermittent hypoxic training at uh, Upgrade Labs, where you work out and you're breathing air that has no oxygen. The oxygen is removed. So the brain just goes into panic, like open the floodgates for oxygen, and then you switch over after you've tricked the brain to breathing pure oxygen. So it can raise the levels of oxygen in the brain by 26 times more than normal. Wow. And there's a sort of a feeling that was similar between carbogen and that, except you're riding on an exercise bike when you're doing this in the lab, so you have like the heart pounding and all that, versus just sort of the peaceful, relaxed, oxygenated brain, mm -hmm. which might be better for creativity, to be honest. Not sure, but I've also done, you know, uh, the assault bike wearing a, um, wearing a, uh, a flow restrictor mask. Yeah, a flow yeah. restrictor mask. And then we've done the altitude uh, the the blowing into the tube to create the altitude yes uh, what's that called I have one of those uh, Alto Lab yeah yeah and by the way that is one of the coolest things I was talking with uh, Brian and uh, the guy who's uh, an astrophysicist guy who almost got the Nobel Prize for discovering gravity waves and he's saying I have this telescope in Chile at nineteen thousand two hundred feet how do I get people acclimated I said Alto Lab and it's it's a cool thing, and I actually may start doing it again because I'm yeah. now flying on a plane that only pressurizes to almost 10,000 feet, and I want my brain to work. And the idea here is you breathe through this little tube for an hour a day for 15 days, and suddenly you're acclimated to, or maybe it's for 20 days, but you're suddenly acclimated to 15,000 feet. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like the best stuff comes out of Russia. The, the Fisher-Wallace device you mentioned before, the cerebral electrical stimulation, I've been using something similar for 20 years. Um, and it came out of the Russian space program so astronauts could sleep less so they could do more work and they could use less fuel to get them into space. And this oxygen restriction device came from the Russian military saying, well, it's expensive to pressurize a jet fighter. Why don't we just make our pilots pressure agnostic? And so they're literally hacking the human body. They're, they're doing you know, crazy peptides. And some of the very best work that's been most impactful on anti-aging is straight out of you know Russian 1980s research. Tell me a little bit about peptides. I know very little other than it's, I understand it's the new age. Well, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, peptides and they're essentially short chains of amino acids. You look at amino acids as individual letters. And when you string them together, you can get uh, a word is, is like one little uh, little peptide. And when you string a bunch of words, these peptides together into a sentence, you've got a protein, right? And you put all the sentences together into a book and you've got a steak. <laughs> so peptides are sometimes just two or three amino acids stuck together in a certain way. And they're very potent signaling molecules in the body. And what the Russians did, uh, and actually this is in the book I was editing on the way down here, my next anti-aging book, um, they're getting peptides from young animals, extracting them in, in ways you know, from agriculture and making these little capsules you can take that are targeted at certain organ systems to make them younger. And that stuff works. It, it's pretty crazy. Uh, another one that's... And they're oral. Those are oral. Wow. Yeah. And you know, they're not particularly cheap. It's about 60 bucks for a month's supply of one. But there's one for... Uh, male performance essentially it's you know or, uh, gonads of, of things you can tell if you take that the the next morning like okay i i noticed that and i don't think that's placebo and there's a, a bunch of actually good research but half it's not even translated and this has been going on for 30 40 years and they're carefully working on it but the idea here is if we can do that we can make peptides in laboratories now that are identical to those and manufacture them and once we acknowledge that they work or we do more research on them then it becomes something, well, wait, maybe we could all get young animal growth signals. Um, another one that's really powerful, your uh, thymus gland. It, it 
gets old very quickly. In fact, by the time you're a young adult, it's mostly gone, yet it's tied to your immunity. So there's a peptide called uh, TB500 um, that I've been using uh, for quite a while. And you can, uh, you can get this stuff. It's not considered a drug or a medicine. It's not for human use. It's in a gray zone. And what TB500 does is it replicates the immune stuff that happens from a healthy thymus. And there's another one for the pineal gland. So instead of taking a gland from an animal, which might have viruses or whatever other weird stuff, you're getting a, a laboratory-made protein fragment that's exactly like what would come off of there. And epitalon, the pineal one, is tied with the lengthening of the telomeres. Wow. A very substantial one. I have several friends who've used it and seen their scores change dramatically on a telomere test. Uh, my only little asterisk on that one would be blood telomeres flop all over the place on a regular basis, so it's not a very reliable indicator that it worked. Uh, but uh, certainly, they're going back for at least 20 years, there's solid research on this compound, and I would consider it a part of an advanced anti-aging stack. Uh, and there are other ones for wound healing, uh, like a BP, uh, BPC-157, which is another one where if you have something that just isn't getting better, your know, knee or whatever, uh, it's a healing gastric peptide. And for people who have GI issues in particular, you can take it orally and it'll reverse Crohn's disease in wow. some studies. Wow. So if your gut's all inflamed, you take some of that. And um, in fact, I did it last week. I, uh, I am cautious around fermented foods. Some fermented foods are good for you, but it's okay if they're not. They don't work for everyone, especially if you have just whatever's going on with your genetics. So I made a, a fermented rice. Uh, uh, it's something called mochi. Uh, it comes from Japan, and I actually have a Japanese mochi maker. So if I want to eat some carbs, it's cooked in cooled rice, resistant starch, uh, and you can. It's culinary wise, it's awesome. It's the stuff they wrap around ice cream, right? But I fermented it with some some special yeast that's good for you, and I reused the water, and something bad grew in there. I don't know what it was, but I ate this stuff, and it tasted amazing. Uh, and then, like my gut is wrecked in a way it has not been wrecked in a long time, uh, and. I said, all right, what am I going to do on this stuff? So I cracked open a vial of, uh, of BPC-157, and I took some because it's a gastric healing peptide, Amazing. and I got better really fast. Amazing. So I'll, uh, I'll, In fact, there's a blog post on these, I believe. If not, I'll, I'll get you the info on them. Please. And for if you're, if you're listening to this, I will put up another post, or I'll highlight this post in the show notes for you. Because these are things where like, your doctor's probably not going to tell you about them. I do know doctors who will use... Um, either one of those compounds uh, intravenously, but they won't ever advertise that or tell you that they do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they'll either use it on themselves or on their special patients because it works. Mm -hmm. And because the science is solid, even if it's not approved. Mm -hmm. And part of my goal in, in doing this show is I want to talk about that stuff because it'll increase demand, which will increase research. And someone out there will, will fund research in order to uh, to make it happen. And there's times when you just fund research because it needs to be done, not because there's a patent. Mm -hmm. Like I helped to fund research at University of Washington around basic water chemistry uh, with Gerald Pollack around the fourth phase of water. Great. And there's no money to be made in that. I just wanted to understand it. And what he found was magic. If there's tiny droplets of butter fat suspended in water, it makes exclusions on water. I'm like there. This is what the Tibetans were doing with their yak butter tea. They didn't have enough energy to use their mitochondrial heat to transform water, which is how we do it normally. So they did it with a butter churn <laughs> ahead of time. They didn't know why it worked, just like your conversation about music. Yeah. They just knew they felt good. Yes, I knew I felt good when I tried it there, and I came back, and I didn't know that was a mechanism in Bulletproof Coffee, but it turns out I funded the research because I wanted to know. Yes. Speaking of water, I also did maybe six months of only deuterium depleted water did you notice anything from that i don't know i don't know but i that said i'll do it again <laughs> you know a deuterium is one of those things i almost put it in in headstrong and i've also experimented and if you're listening going due to what water deuterium is a heavy isotope of hydrogen the so-called heavy water and it's used mostly in the the nuclear industry and it turns out there's about 160 parts per million of deuterium uh, and areas where there's a little bit more in the groundwater, there tends to be more disease, and deuterium clogs up your mitochondrial function. So there's a theory out there that says if you drink deuterium-depleted water and get ready to spend, you're going to spend a couple grand a month on this water. 
And if you do that for a while, your mitochondria are supposed to uh, work better. Uh, you know, angels will sing and all sorts of good things happen. And I didn't put it in the book because the ROI on deuterium depleted water, it's not there. Uh, you, you spend so much time, I'm only gonna drink this water, I'm only gonna cook vegetables. And by the way, fats don't have deuterium issues, but carbs do. And if they're grown in a high deuterium environment, they do. So I, I actually even paid consultants to go out and find deuterium processes around the world mm -hmm. and to see if I could make it affordable. But end of the day, I cannot feel a difference from that. And I know what good mitochondrial function feels like because you can manipulate it with other compounds like NAD. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at that as if I was incredibly rich and dying of cancer, yeah. I'd be all over that deuterium. But otherwise, I... I'm not certain that it meets the bar for worth the effort. Mm -hmm. But if, if you just said it turned your brain on and angels actually did sing, I'd have listened. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know yet. I'm gonna I'm gonna do more research. Yeah, um, think and, which other ones and obviously things like the aura ring tracking. Yeah, tracking is good. I've been wearing the aura ring for a long time and you know, tracking sleep for ten plus years with EEG and things. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed, Rick, that's really cool. I did that whole body stem cell makeover recently. Uh, where I had stem cells in the brain, the spinal cord, every joint in the body, like everywhere. Uh, it was it was a pretty intense thing. But afterwards, my sleep quality is is different. I, I mean, like noticeably different. I'm putting together my talk for the the Bulletproof conference, which is I think this episode is going to come out after the conference, but it's happening in the next day or two. And I took a screenshot of one of these because it was ridiculous. I slept, uh, here we go, uh, yeah, I slept five hours and 54 minutes. So a little bit less than six hours of sleep, but I got two hours and 23 minutes of REM and two hours and 20 minutes of deep sleep. Incredible. And these are scores in eight hours that you might get when you're 20. Yeah. Right? And holy crap, I, th these are breaking records for me, and I've been tracking for a long time, and I think that the the stuff the stem cells did in my brain, my nervous system really did do it, but I'm stacking it. Like you said, I'm blocking the blue lights. I have a glasses company that does that stuff. Uh, and I take, you know, all the sleep stack stuff that I've written about and Like I, this is when I'm dialed in and my room's dark and you know, every little advantage I can get, but still this for me, even five, six years ago, if I got a half hour of deep sleep, I was pretty happy. Yeah. Right, because I came from an inflamed, unhealthy perspective. So I, I feel like I still don't get that much deep. I, you don't. It's, I get a lot of REM and a little bit of deep. It could be as little as five minutes. It could really? be, I mean, on a good day, it'll be an hour, but but not more. But but I've had five hours of REM on some nights. Wow, five hours! I've never hit five hours. Yeah. So well, you're such a creative guy. I mean, so I much creativity does happen in in REM. I mean, there's so much communicating and stuff mm. going on there wow so how do you hack that i guess at a certain point you have to start looking at gro human growth hormone because if you never get deep sleep your growth mm -hmm. hormone levels will be low clinically mm -hmm. and then maybe supplementing it's a good idea mm -hmm. uh, but i know uh um that requires you know the the small insulin needles which aren't your favorites no so huh well maybe there's an, well there's oral actually there's oral peptides that raise growth hormone levels that might be there for you. Wow, that sounds good. All right, I am going to uh, I'm going to double check which are the ones I'm thinking of here, um, but I'll I'll hook you up afterwards. Great. I'm um, just with the name of it because yeah. um, I think it I think that just from a very selfish perspective, Rick, uh, I would like you to keep doing cool music so I can listen <laughs> to it. So we gotta we gotta give you many many more years Great. of functioning at the level you I'm are. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You mentioned uh, about the meta meditation. You mentioned uh, loving kindness. That's something you focus on. How do you define loving kindness? What comes up is related to something that I wanted to mention, and it's another side of it. It's like, it's a little bit like praying. And we didn't cover praying in the, in the stack. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, I include, I include prayer. I look for opportunities to use prayer. So for example, if we pray before meals, it's a great opportunity because we know we eat a couple of times a day. Right. So if we're praying before meals or if we pray when we wake up or if we pray when we go to sleep, we're doing those things every day. So if we can tie the practice to something we're already doing, it, um, wow, I just had great deja vu. Just now when the light oh, changed. Cool. <laughs> 
we've had this conversation before. <laughs> that <awesome>. was amazing. <laughs> amazing. So, so, and, and in prayer, it's, it's not asking for anything. It's more like, um, an agreement to be a, uh, humble servant, mm. um, and to have each, have, have each step be for the highest good for all. Yeah. Um, and I think of loving kindness in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, 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 one of the meditations, or maybe you could call it a prayer that I do is, is I'll, I'll say, thank you for using me today. Uh, right. And it, I don't have to be rational about it. I don't have to know why it works, but no. if I do that, it just seems like it's a better day. Yeah. Uh, and I don't actually define who I'm, who I'm talking to, who's using me that day. Yes. Um, and uh, so when you pray, am I, are you praying to a specific you know, deity of choice or not specific, just the not universe. Specific, yes. Okay. Yes. I am your vehicle. I'll do your will. Please guide me yeah. for the highest good. Yeah. Uh, and I, I love it that, that you talk about that. And that's, that's the side of biohacking that I think sometimes gets lost in, in the ego of, you know, I grew abs <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I'm going to have the highest performing brain. You got to ask, okay, you have the world's highest performing brain what are you going to do with it, right? And it's that loving kindness aspect that you talked about um, that certainly I, I picked up in, in Tibet when I was there to learn meditation and in you know, some of the neurofeedback and the other experiences I've had on the shamanic training where if you're missing that sense of mission or even just sense of service, even if it's not mission-based, yeah. you probably won't have the biomarkers that you want <laughs> <laughs> to tie it right back to ego. Like something isn't going to work out the way that it otherwise could. And that's the one that's hardest to explain to people like you and me who are gathering data, but you've clearly noticed that. And I've picked that up in, in my own life as well. And I love that we can talk about that and, um, you know, just put it, put it on the air because if, if you're listening to the show right now and you're saying, well, you know, that's stuff's a bunch of crap, you know, why would these crazy people pray? You know, there is no God or whatever. It doesn't matter if there's a God. Right. What's going on is the act of praying does something to your neuro neurology or to your soul, whatever you want to call it, that makes you better. Yeah. <laughs> and gratitude practice. We know that it works. Yeah. yeah we know that it works. We, science proves that it works. Right. Yeah. You can science your gratitude. Yeah. How do you practice gratitude? It depends. I've, in the past, I've used a gratitude journal. Right. It, it can be included in the, in the, uh, in the meal prayers. Mm, right. Those are the ones that come to mind, but I'm, I'm sure there are others. <laughs> okay. I've got two more questions for you, Rick. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them has to do with failure. Yep. How do you handle things when you absolutely fail at something? I always think about it in terms of, uh, I, I start with the idea that everything we do is an experiment. So the stakes are, oh, I try to keep the, in my mind, I always try to think of the stakes being very low. For everything and that it's all an experiment and we're we're just playing we're just here to play so if something works i know okay that experiment didn't work in the way that i thought it might but it it taught me something i learned okay if i want to do this thing that's not the way to do it and now i can try this other method i guess it's more of just a mindset of uh using all f thinking of it as feedback Mm. And taking the feedback and using it to the for the highest good, whatever whatever that is. Got it. So you depersonalize it, okay? Yeah. And the final question for you is one I've been asking as the sort of the new question on Bulletproof Radio. Now that Game Changers is out and I got that big data set. Mm -hmm. um, although man, I'd kind of like to ask you that question too. But the new one is: How long do you want to live, and how long do you think you're going to live? Because I'm writing about anti-aging and potential immortality. What, what do you, what's your take on that? I'd like to live as long as possible. I don't have a number in mind. Yeah. I suppose I'd like to live in a healthy way as long as possible. Yeah. Even more, you know, even more so. But also, I'm, um, I follow the universe's intention for <laughs> me go. and wh <laughs> wherever it leads, it leads. Yeah. I've enjoyed the time that I've had and I look forward to enjoying more and whenever it's done it's done it's a very buddhist perspective right I, I like to say that i'd like to die at a time and by a method of my choosing 
That's a good one. <laughs> so, so there's always an out. That's nice. Uh, but but also, you know, if I'm not supposed to be here, I'll probably get the message, mm. right? And then you know things work out. Yeah. Uh, which is a uh, uh, a lot of people sort of you know rage against the dying of the light sort of thing. But I'm not convinced that rage to live longer is a good strategy. But no, and I can remember I had a friend whose mom had a, a a very serious cancer and she was really committed to beating the cancer and she did everything she could do both alternative wise and western to beat it and it went on for years and it became sort of the focus of her life and then i ran into her one day and there was a calmness about her and it was it was like she was a different per before she was this vigilant person fighting for something and now she was this it was like something she'd shifted and she said i know i'm gonna pass and it's okay and i'm uh, at peace and it it seems that something happens when we know that we're gonna pass that makes it okay it's like so I don't know if it's a chemical process, or if or if it's purely a spiritual process. I don't, I don't know how, or maybe it's maybe it's both. It could be both. A little bit yeah. of DMT comes in, and you yeah. see whatever's going on. And yeah. I, I've witnessed that as well from a family friend who was dying of a brain tumor. He'd come over and use my hyperbaric chamber. He's like, I, I meditate in there. This is great. Yeah. And and you know, it would make his brain work well enough to spend more time with his family. But he fought and then decided, okay, I'm done. But there was a level of peace and just like happiness and being with the community and it was it was really a, a blessing to be able to see that 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 shift because it, it was very dramatic uh, so yeah and there's something there had like like uh, 20 years ago or so my appendix burst and um and i didn't go to the hospital and um i never had it removed so wow. there's a certain um i don't know i i didn't i didn't believe i was going to die from that experience i got really sick i bet boy did i boy <laughs> i can't tell you how sick i was <laughs> um, and uh but i also found that when i get really sick really creative thoughts come yeah that makes sense you kind of hallucinate almost yeah wow <laughs> rick i feel like uh, we could chat for hours and doubtlessly we will but not on uh, not on the mic Thank you for being a guest on Bulletproof Radio, for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, and your your music and the music of the people you work with uh, with the world. It's had a, a profound impact on me long before long before I met you, and I'm grateful for our friendship and for you being on the show. Great. Thank you so much, and I look forward to doing it again. <laughs>